My name is Kathy Cutshaw. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Administration here at UH Manoa. Um, and welcome to our community discussion this afternoon. And thank you for all taking time out of your busy days to come and dialogue with us. Uh, unfortunately, Chancellor Apple cannot be at this meeting this afternoon. He sends his deepest regrets. But I guarantee this subject is very near and dear to his heart. So he will be watching the video uh, when he can. Hi, Tom. Um, this afternoon, we're going to start with an overview of computer, computer services. Um, we're going to turn this over to Deb Hubler, who's the Director of Campus Services, to start that presentation. We'll open it up when they're done for comments, suggestions, and questions. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Is the sound okay on this? Okay. Um, as Kathy said, my name is Deborah Hubler, Director of Campus Services here at UH Manoa. Um, Commuter and Fleet Services is one of the divisions within our department. Some of you might be wondering what is Commuter and Fleet Services. You might remember us more better as parking and transportation. We changed our name last year to Commuter and Fleet Services because we feel it's a better reflection of who we are today as an organization and what we're trying to accomplish. Because once upon a time, I think the main thing that we were trying to do is just address the parking situation on campus. How do we satisfy the demand for parking? But um, over as time has gone by, we realize there's really a lot more ways that people get to campus besides just driving, right? People drive, but they also bike, walk, carpool, and they take the bus to come to work. So we decided we needed to focus more on the overall needs of our campus community as far as commuters are concerned. So we feel that commuter and fleet services just depicts more what it is that we're trying to do with our day-to-day -day operations. And our mission, I'm going to read this to you, to maximize access to the UH Manoa campus through a commitment to innovation, environmental sustainability, resource management, and quality customer service. And I think we've done a pretty good job of um, trying to make changes, to streamline some of our operations, become more efficient, become more customer friendly. And to talk a little bit more about that, I am going to invite up Raymond Shito. He is our manager of Commuter and Fleet Services, and he'll talk a little bit about some of the things that we've done over the last few years. Thank you, Deb. Aloha, everyone. Glad to see everyone here. I wanted to talk to you about how commuter services, and I'll be interchanging between the terms commuter services and parking office are when I speak in the past about or the way we did business in the past. But I'd like to talk about how we've been changing and evolving and trying to be more, uh, how do you say, accessible to the campus. We've enhanced our customer service and we've been increasing our accessibility to create a more friendlier campus. We've also been trying to maximize efficiency by innovating and automating a lot of our operations to save money. Now, I'm gonna talk about some of the changes that I'm pretty sure many of you were here when I refer to the, the past. Now, how many of you remember when Everyone had to stop at the gate if you didn't have a parking pass. So as you drove onto campus, you were stopped by an attendant at East West Somali Way. And if you didn't have a pass, you had to pay the attendant a fee to get onto the campus. Now that has changed. Uh, we, you now can drive right onto the campus anytime before 4 p.m. without having any pass or permit to display. What we've done is um, we've tried to make the campus more open and accessible to everyone. We were getting you know, a lot of feedback about how we seem to be more like a military base. I'm pretty sure many of you also remember how when you had a guest come onto campus or when you were a guest trying to visit the campus, there were only two visitor parking areas on the upper campus areas. And the main one was behind Kennedy Theater and the other one was located at, by Bachman Hall. We've changed that and we now have seven different visitor parking areas distributed around the upper campus. We have them by Varney Circle, Seymour Halle, uh, by the Center for Korean Studies, and by Kaikendal right out here. So that's another change that we, that we made over the years. Another thing that I think many of you remember, and I see a lot of our friends from student services, so it's, it's not, um, they're very familiar with this, it's like, we were sometimes referred to being very similar to the DMV. If you had to buy a parking permit, you know, a new employee or student had to buy a parking permit, you had to come down to the parking office 
and stand in a long line, present your documents to the clerk, and then purchase your pass. And then, heaven forbid, if you for forgot the right document or you didn't have your registration or something, you were sent away to only to come back and stand in line again to purchase that. We've since then automated everything. Employees and students now can go online to reserve and purchase their permits. We've also shortened the lines by having uh, locations for distribution of permits during the peak periods during the start of each semester. Uh, for those students or non-traditional students who had to purchase evening permits, one of the things that we were constantly being asked about is extending our hours because many of our non-traditional students are working and in order to get that evening permit to attend classes and they had to take time off of work, come to our office, purchase the pass and we've since changed, excuse me, we've since changed that with our online system we now have our students purchase the passes online and as the student drives onto campus they they just approach the attendant, provide them with the appropriate information like their identification or receipt, and they are issued their monthly evening pass right there at the gate as they drive on. So no need to stand in line at the parking office or take time off from work to get your evening permit. Another thing that has changed, and I think some of the departments really like this, is our department guest pass. Every day we have numerous guests that departments invite to come and speak, or to visit the campus. And in the past, it was quite a lengthy process. You, the department staff would put in a request and wait until an approval was received. And once their approval was received, they'd come and again, I keep referring to the long line at the parking office to purchase their pass. Then the worst part of it is they either had to mail the pass out to their guests or they had to stand in the parking lot and when the guests arrived, they would hand the guests their parking pass so that they could park without getting heaven forbid, a parking ticket. We've now automated that. Authorized department staff can go online to request and purchase their department guest pass. And again, uh, to make it easy for the guests, the guests can print out this pass from their computer at home. They no longer have to get the pass in their hand to put on the car. Everything has been automated for them. We've also made some other technological advances, and this has helped in the areas of the citations and appeal process. We now have that online. People, if they do receive a citation or they wish to file a, an appeal because they'd like to contest the ticket they receive, they can go online to do that. You know, I. Um, and it's really a simple process. I, I know a lot of people are confused when they go online and they, they think it's a very difficult process, but you know, uh, just about a week ago, I was walking through the lot and there was a student and they were about to Im immobilize the student's car. In other words, they were putting a boot on the car and they were asking the student that they would have to go to the office to pay for their tickets and then also there would be a $100 fee to remove the boot. And the the girl quickly whipped out her, her phone and said, can I pay for this with my iPhone? I'll pay my tickets now and so to prevent putting that boot on my car. And fortunate for her, I was passing by, they, the guards all looked at me and so I could, you know, let her, let her do that. And it was as simple as that. She went online, paid for her tickets, and let her go. So it's not very difficult to use these uh, online things that I'm talking about. We also automated uh, the, the counting of vehicles that go into the parking structure. We now have a system that counts each vehicle that goes in and goes out of the parking structure. And how that has helped is, we had a manual system. We had guards driving around in golf carts all day long counting the cars in the parking structure because we had to ensure that we had enough spaces in the structure so when permit holders arrived, there was a space for the permit holders. Where pretty much we advertise, we guarantee a space for you if you have a permit. Well, the difficult part is we also want to maximize the number of students or visitors coming that want to pay for parking. And to do that, we need a count of how many vehicles are in there at all times. And that manual system is now automated, gives us a better picture of what's going on, and we're more efficient in, in calculating how many visitor vehicles can be allowed into the structure. 
that helps the student because now, you know, instead of coming at 7.30 and the, the lot's closed, we can stay open a little bit longer because we have a better picture of what's going on. We're hoping to make some future changes and we'll be increasing the benefits for student carpool permits, which was a suggestion by one of the students on our, our advisory committee. And Crystal Atkins, our TDM coordinator, will be speaking more about that. And also, the employee drop-off passes. I'm not sure how many of you do not drive to work, but for employees who do not drive to work, we have a pass that you could purchase from the parking office so that you could be dropped off and picked up and the person driving wouldn't have to stop at the gate, especially after four, to pay the attendant. We're planning on providing that pass free so that the, the fee of $10 is gonna be waived. We're also, excuse me, we're also increasing the number of department passes that we're giving to the deans. Currently, deans have a pass that they use for their business and to accommodate some of their guests. We're increasing that number to four passes for each dean so that they can accommodate their department guests and also to facilitate official department business for their staff. So that hope, we're hoping that that helps the departments conduct their university business. And we're currently having a problem with our visitor parking. I'm not sure if you noticed that if you go into our visitor lots now, on the, especially on the upper campus, they're quite full most of the time. And some of that is due to all the construction projects taking place. We've noticed that vehicles are staying longer. We have uh, contractors to parking in there. They're paying, but there's no movement. They're taking spaces all day. So we're going to be implementing a three hour time limit for visitor parking on the upper campus areas. Now this won't affect departments who buy the passes. They'll still be able to buy their passes for their guests to park. And that won't be affected by the time limit. But for regular visitor parking, it would be limited to three hours. And for those that want to park for an extended period, we're recommending that they park in the parking structure. Now, other initiatives to promote carpooling and green, use of green cars, we'll, we'll be trying that later on this summer. And one of the ideas we have is to designate carpool spaces in the parking structure for those who carpool. We issue students a carpool pass and you know, one of the things our student representative on our advisory committee asks is what kind of benefits we would have. And I'm kind of stepping into Crystal's area already, but uh, we'll be designating some areas where those who carpool will have a, a preferred parking area. Now, since I'm already stepping into our area, I guess it's a good time to introduce Crystal Atkins. Uh, she's our transportation demand uh, coordinator, and she'll be speaking more about some of the how, how would I say, alternative transportation ways of getting to campus. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. My job as the TDM coordinator is to promote other ways to get to campus other than bringing your car and parking it here. Oops. Where's the button? There we go. We have about 5,700 permitted parking spaces on campus, but we have about 28,000 people that come every day. In 2010, we developed a TDM plan to focus more services to the faculty, staff, and students who do not bring a car to campus, in part because building more parking is simply cost prohibitive. Just the construction alone for new parking is between thirty and $50,000 a space. It's very expensive. To develop a TDM plan, we needed to understand how people travel to and from campus. You might remember filling out the transportation survey in 2010 where we gathered this information. We're getting ready to do the survey again so we can track progress. So please watch for an email in the next couple weeks um, that will tell you where to find that survey and please do take it. As you can see by the pie chart, actually the majority of us do not bring a car to campus. The transportation surveys told us some really interesting things, such as 43% of all faculty, staff, and students live within three miles of campus. 
and one out of five of us actually live within one mile. Those are very commutable distances using an alternative mode, such as walking or biking or taking a short transit trip. We also learned that there's considerable interest in trying an alternative mode to get to campus. And some of the reasons that we heard for that were things like economics, sustainability, health. Those were the top reasons that we heard. So let's take transit for instance. To use transit, you need to be near a transit line. And we found that most of us do live within a quarter mile of a bus stop. In fact, 33% of us live within a quarter mile of a bus stop, a local bus, that directly serves campus. To try and determine the market potential for increased transit, we asked those who didn't currently ride the bus if they had an interest in doing so. And almost 63% said yes. Research tells us that about uh, one third of the people who express an interest in changing to using transit will actually begin using transit. I mean, habit changes are difficult for us all. So when we did the calculations, we estimate that we can reasonably increase transit ridership by another uh, 3,700 uh, 3, people, 3,700 folks. So one of the easiest ways to increase transit ridership is to offer an employee U-Pass program where every employee would receive a transit pass each month. We'd really like to do an employee U-Pass um, program because we saw a tremendous increase in transit ridership when the student U-Pass program was initiated. And in fact, we have a tentative agreement with the city to do the program all we need is the funding to initiate it. We work really closely with the city and their bus operator, Oahu Transit Services, to improve service to campus. For example, the Route 13 um, began coming onto campus this last semester. Not only can students hop on the bus, say, at Scheidler and ride to Gateway House, they can hop on the 13 and go down to Waikiki to the beach. Ridership on the 13 has increased enough that the city is planning to add more buses to the route. So the 13 will soon be coming every 15 minutes. We have a really good working relationship with the city and OTS, and we all have a common interest of trying to increase ridership to and from campus. When people live close to campus, walking and biking become a very viable transportation mode for them. We looked at um, the willingness for people to, to think about walking or biking. We found some interest in walking from those that don't currently walk. We found more interest in those who don't currently bike and wanting to bike to campus. We also heard loud and clear that pedestrian and bicycle facilities both on and to campus need some improvements. Obviously, the university has more control over its own facilities. We have been replacing the old, less secure uh, bike racks with modern U racks. Plus, we have great partners in our campus planning division. So there are better bike and pedestrian facilities included in the various master plan documents and the vice chancellor's office with the Move of Aloha campaign. We all work together along with the Hawaii Bicycling League and Cycle Manoa to advocate for the new bike lanes on Wailai that will be installed this fall when they repave Wailai Avenue. Carpooling is an area where we really need to put a little more effort. Um, as Ray mentioned, we're making some changes to the carpool pass program for students. During non-peak hours, those with a valid carpool pass can park in the parking structure or on upper campus. And after 1 p.m., those with a valid carpool pass will not have to pay if they arrive um, without their carpool partner. You probably don't realize it, but the university has had a carpool ride matching system for a very long time. It is frankly not a very good system and no one uses it. 
So we are looking at purchasing a modern social media based rideshare system that has proven very popular and successful at other universities. It allows you to make regular carpool matches, but it also allows you to do one-time matches so that you could get together and go to an event or go surfing. We're, as Ray mentioned, we're also looking at designating some preferential parking spaces in the zoned lots and in the parking structure for carpools and green vehicles. So speaking of green vehicles, green, the electric vehicles with the license plate park for free in the parking structure. We have two dual charging stations in the structure and I've been told that they are the most heavily used stations on the island. We are talking with a couple other companies to see if we can get some more charging stations installed. Enterprise Car Share is the new name for the WeCar. Having a car share vehicle on campus and available at really reasonable rates makes it either easier to commit to using an alternative transportation mode on a regular basis. You have access to a car when you need one, but not the expenses or the hassle of having to bring your car and park it here. Our enterprise car share program is the largest in the state. And we have been growing enough that we are getting a fourth vehicle on campus in the next couple weeks. The Rainbow Shuttle provides almost a quarter million rides a year. It provides critical ADA access on campus and it's a secure ride at night after dark. We've been beginning to look at the shuttle service as just more than a people mover around campus. We've made some changes, so it is a good people mover on campus. We've made the routes kind of shorter and they're more frequent. They, um, you'll see more buses coming to the stops on campus. Uh, and we added the Campus Express that just circulates quickly around campus. But we also realized that the shuttle can help bridge that gap between where the transit surface ends and getting up to campus. So all the new buses, except for the Campus Express, because it doesn't go off campus, have bike racks on them. And we began the YLI route because we found in the survey that there's a gap between the transit service in Palolo Valley, Kaimuki, and Kahala, and here. Because that wildlife route is really compensating for a gap in transit service, we're going to run that route year round. So you know, the, the Rainbow Shuttle is actually a pretty awesome service if you think about it. But there's one really frustrating thing about the, the shuttle right now. You never know when the shuttle is coming unless you see it coming at you on the street. But that's no more. I am so happy to tell you that we have purchased a GPS tracking system. Our contractor worked over spring break to get it installed and now you will be able to see where the bus is coming on your computer or on your smartphone. And if this link works, I'm going to show it to you. All right. So you can see there's, there's the, the various colors or the different lines. You can see that that bus just moved. Let's look at the Campus Express. And it shows you the route. It shows you where it's at right now. It is arriving at Holmes Hall. It gives you an estimate of when it's going to be to your stop. And we have, don't think we have quite all the lines on here yet, but we have the majority of them and within the week that we will. Um, so please watch for an email coming out next week that will give you a link to download one of the free uh, phone apps. We're getting to download these apps even before they get to the App Store. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our transportation heroes uh, that may be in the audience today. You saw their video clips when you first came in. 
These are people that are using alternative modes on a regular basis, and they volunteered to share their experience and their tips on how to get started. We're very grateful to them. Their videos are very inspiring, so I, um, I would encourage you to go and see them on our website if you haven't seen them thus far. So now I am going to turn it back to Deb. Thank you, Crystal. That's exciting stuff. Are you guys excited? Hey, we're excited. <laughs> um, I hope you liked some of what you heard from Ray and Crystal. Um, we're actually, we're pretty, we're, we are pretty excited about some of the things that we've been able to do with technology. Um, and we just also wanted to let you know that we don't operate in a vacuum. We do have a, an advisory committee that um, is made up of representatives from various areas of our campus community. So we do have staff representation from faculty, um, APT, civil service administration, student representation from the various student organizations on campus, and then also representation from um, other departments that we work closely with in our day-to-day -day operations, such as campus planning, facilities, campus security, et cetera. And we take these um, ideas, ideas that we think of, we take it to the committee and ask them what they think. And then we ask them for feedback on what's important to them as well. And so some of the things that have come up in the course of our meetings, um, which we've had two meetings this year, and then it, the committee was dormant for a couple of years. And then um, it, I think we had meetings, about a half dozen that we held about two or three years ago. So some of the things that came up during the course of the meetings are things like enforcement, um, should we build more parking? Um, how can we be a more bike-friendly campus? Should we have subsidized bus passes? And should we have tiered parking rates? Now, there are good things and challenges about each of those different issues. So for example, for enforcement, um, we were told, well, maybe you guys are enforcing too much, which may be true. We can always scale back on, on our enforcement. But the reason that we have been having strict enforcement is because if you, as a permit holder, have paid for a parking permit, I imagine you're going to want to be able to park in your zone whenever you need to be able to park. And if we're um, not strict on the enforcement, then you might have people from other zones who are parking in your area or people who have no permits at all who are parking. And um, it, we, we do get complaints about that. And we've had people come and call us and say, hey, I see people here with no permits. You need to come and cite because I, I can't find a parking stall in my zone. And that also leads to ensuring equity. If you've paid for a parking permit, um, you should be able to park, and somebody who has not paid for parking should not have that same benefit without having paid for it. And especially, I think, if you paid for upper campus parking, um, you know, some, lower campus parking is about $150 less right now than upper campus parking. So you don't want to see a Zone 20 person in your stall, in one of your stalls during peak hours because, and you know, some people are upset because, hey, I paid for the privilege of having upper campus parking, and so I should be able to have that upper campus parking available to me. Um, the challenges are is that it can create a negative impression of our department and also of the university, and especially for um, visitors. I mean, admittedly, if you're a visitor, and especially if this is the first time that you're coming to the campus, it's not necessarily that easy to know where it's okay for you to park and where it's not okay to park. So it's not that unusual for visitors to sometimes get parking citations. I do think that our, um, our appeals process is pretty good about being understanding about those kinds of situations but they can create a, you know, a bad taste in people's mouth if they come here for a special event or something and then end up with a parking ticket. And then it also can create a difficult work environment for both staff um, who receive parking tickets and for the ones who give out the parking tickets as well. Um, you know, if you are getting parking tickets and you don't know why you're getting them, you know, you feel they're erroneous, I'm sure that can create a stressful situation for you. But also, um, you know, we've had unfortunate situations where our, our citation officers have had um, pellet guns shot at them and they've had food and soda cans thrown at them from windows and things like that and you know that's that's not a good situation for them to be in and also um, on a fairly regular basis our parking commuter staff can get yelled at from people who get parking citations because they're upset so that's just something that we as management have to be concerned about because we're all one big family and they're just trying to do their jobs by and large I think most of the people that interact with them are polite and courteous but we do have um, probably an unusually large amount of people who are somewhat verbally abusive to our staff. So that's just something that we need to be aware of. Um, as far as building additional parking structures, the benefit to that is that obviously it would help to satisfy the demand for parking. I think that's probably more of an issue for students than it is for staff and faculty because as a staff or faculty member, you're going to be able to get 
a parking permit if, you wanna, if you're willing to pay for one. You may not be able to park where you want to park. You may end up in the structure when you'd rather have upper campus parking, but you are going to be able to get at least a parking permit. Students, usually only graduate assistants, seniors, and maybe a handful of juniors will get, to, will get parking permits before we run out of the parking permits. You heard Crystal mention that we only have 5,700 permitted stalls on campus and then 20-something thousand people who come to campus on a daily basis. So. The challenges are that if we build more parking, they will come. <laughs> and so um, it can increase traffic congestion, which is pretty much in the opposite direction of where the university has said they want to go as far as our green missions um, of sustainability. Um, create safety hazards. You know, the more vehicles we have on campus, the more likelihood there are for accidents. And then, of course, the price of parking goes up. We would have to pay for the parking structure out of our parking operations, which means higher permit prices for you. And honestly, you do not want to know how much more you would have to pay for parking if we decided to move forward with building additional structures. Um, we do want to be a more bike-friendly campus. Uh, you know, again, it's green. It's green-friendly. It goes to, it goes towards our sustainability mission. It's a low-cost alternative for commuters. Co commuters. I didn't put it up here, but it's also a nice, healthy way to get to work. The challenges are that the bike lanes coming into campus um, are not necessarily the most bike-friendly lanes. It's a little scary. Uh, you know, as a driver, it makes me nervous to see some of these bikers because they're they're just so narrow. Um, and you've heard Crystal say that we have been working with the bus on trying to improve the conditions coming into the campus and also on campus. You know, if you're on East West Road and Miley Road, the roads are just not wide enough to be able to have room for the cars to drive, plus bikes, plus for the parallel parking that we have on the road. So I don't know if you've noticed that we have those shower lane um, markings, which is the bike with the two arrows that are painted every so often. And that's just a reminder to people to remember that you're sharing it. Bikes and um, bikes, pedestrians actually, and cars are all sharing it. So we all just need to watch out for each other. Bike racks, um, we work with campus planning as far as deciding where the bike racks go, could go. It's not necessarily our decision, but um, we've heard complaints that there's not enough bike racks on campus. So that's something that we're taking a look at. And then just, again, monitoring bicycle behavior. I think, again, by and large, most bicyclists are pretty safe in the way they um, comport themselves, but there are some daredevils every once in a while. Um, you know, sometimes they don't get off in the no-ride places. It can be dangerous for pedestrians as well as vehicles and bicyclists. So that's just something that we have to think about as we encourage more bicyclists to come to campus. The subsidized bus passes, um, you know, we, we talked about um, there's a U-Pass that's available for students. We've talked about having something like that similar available for our staff and faculty. Again, it, it goes towards our sustainability mission. It's a low or no cost alternative for commuters depending on how that program might be structured. The challenges for that is that who's gonna pay for it? Again, if it's something that's part of our program, the, the cost that's gonna to go to the bus per head would have to come out of the revenues that come from the parking permits and the citations and things like that. So. Um, I think some people are fine with that and they, you know, they're like, you know, if we can get more people to not drive and not bring cars to work, that's a benefit. And so they're willing to pay for um, a little bit more for their parking permit for that. Some people are vehemently opposed to the idea of their parking revenues helping to pay for somebody else to ride the bus if they're not planning on using the bus themselves. And then the capacity of the bus, just making sure that if we do have more bus riders, if we were able to implement this program, that they'd be able to absorb any additional bus riders to campus um, should that program move forward. And then I'm, I'm totally guilty. People love their cars. People are very attached to their cars. So even if they had a free bus pass that was provided to them and they could come to work for free, there's still, there are still people that are going to choose to drive. So that's just a fact of life that we have to deal with. Tiered parking rates is something else that has been proposed. Um, you know, we already have um, one set of tiers based on location. You know, I mentioned that upper campus costs more than lower campus because it's considered premium parking. Other tiers that have been suggested is different rates for students um, and then making a tier based on salary as a percentage of your salary. So there are, um, there are issues on both sides of the coin for that as well. The students, um, you heard me mention that not all students are eligible for parking in the first place. So that's one restriction that the students have. And also, you know, they only have lower campus parking. And they're usually not on campus as much as staff and faculty are. You know, most of us are here at least 40 hours, if not more every day, five days a week at least. Students usually are here maybe only in the mornings or they might be here only on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, depending on when their classes are. So is it fair that they're paying the same rate as a staff and faculty member who's using the stall all the time? 
On the other side of the coin, they are using a stall, so maybe they should be paying the same rates. As far as the staff is concerned, um, you know, again, er everybody is working 40 hours a week, we're assuming, most of the time, and if, if not more, and so should they be paying different rates based on their salary? That's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, we're not some nameless parking company like downtown where it doesn't matter who you are, everybody pays the same rate. We are a family, we consider ourselves our ahana, so should we consider saying if you make a little bit less on the pay scale that you should be paying less for parking than somebody who might be making six figures or more. So that's something that's been suggested to us. And then as far as our fiscal picture, you know, just the reality of it is that we do not get any external funding outside of what we bring in ourselves. We don't get any funding from the legislature or from the university. So we have to be able to sustain our, sustain our operations on what we bring in. Some of the major expenses, you know, you've heard us talking about the shuttles, those are pretty costly. The special events, traffic control, um, repair and maintenance, that's a really big one because those are just big projects that cost a lot of money. We know offhand that uh, we had a, a parking condition survey report done on our parking structures and they need at least $16 million worth of repair and maintenance projects within the next five to ten years. And our surface lots need an additional $5 million in repair and maintenance, paving and things like that in the next five to ten years. With our current rate structure, we cannot afford to make these kinds of repair and maintenance projects. So again, that's something else that we have to think of as we decide what direction we want to move in because at some point it is going to become a health and safety um, consideration as if we don't address these repairs right away. And you know some of these, these things that we talked about, you know, people are suggesting to us, but there usually is a price attached to that. So this is kind of where we want to throw it out to you, our campus community, and ask you what's important to you. You know, we are here to serve you, so we want to hear from you. Like some of the things that you heard today, what sounds good to you, what don't you like, do you have other ideas that you'd like to share with us, or any other comments that you have come here to share with us. Um, we're open to questions here. We also have set up this email address, so if people are watching on the webcast or if you're here but you're too shy to speak in the microphone, you're welcome to email us with any comments or suggestions about um, our parking and transportation issues as well. That concludes our presentation and now we're going to open up the floor for questions. Hi, my name is Lele, and I'm a graduate student in the oceanography department. And um, thank you so much for those presentations. Um, I've been here for three years, and um, I think making this a bike-friendly campus would be really fantastic. It would help a lot with the congestion, and of course, it's healthy, and it would help with the parking. Um, I, I, some of the challenges I, I bike most days, and some of the challenges I've faced definitely is the safety of biking in and those bike lanes. I think um, the more we can sort of make those bike lanes or bike share symbols visible, the better. Um, and one thing that I was hoping that could be put up for consideration is changing the policy of allowing bikes in, into buildings. I know that the two buildings that I'm in, Post and MSB, um, Post especially, they really enforce it. They yell at you. They, they threaten to call campus security if you try and even roll your bike through the building. And at MSB, we have signs, um, but I haven't been yelled at yet. And, <laughs> and I've had two bikes stolen in Hawaii, so I don't think locking my bike outside is a viable option. I can't afford to keep buying bikes. And of course, I don't want to deal with the inconvenience of getting my bike stolen. So I think it sh we should be allowed to keep our bikes in our offices. I think it's completely reasonable to say no bikes in hallways or classrooms, but I, I think we should be able to bring our bikes into just roll our buildings, bikes through the buildings. I just wanted to suggest that and hope that can be considered. Thank you. Yes, we can consider that. We have, um, as I mentioned um, on our committee, we have representation from facilities and from campus planning as well. So um, it's, a, it's a good group to have that discussion in. So we'll bring that up at our next committee meeting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering about um, the charging of parking at night, particularly when there are community groups that may come in and use the campus. Uh, charging parking on Christmas Eve when it is completely deserted 
Um, what is the rationale for parking, for charging parking in the evening hours, other than revenue? Thank you for your question. Yes, uh, revenue is one of the reasons we do charge. It does provide us with uh, a large number of uh, funds to sustain our programs. But also, we've also had uh, in years past problems with traffic and parking in the evening. And that's one of the reasons why we need that revenue. We do have officers that are patrolling and keeping parking and traffic safe in, during the evening hours. And so it's a balance. You know, we could reduce our, our, our expenditures and we could try to eliminate charging in the evening, but then again, we'll have to consider there may be other problems that may develop. Again, this is something that we'll bring up with our committee. I think that's, you know, those are valid points that we can look at and we hopefully can find a balance. Thank you, my name is Morgan. I'm with uh, Building and Grounds. Um, you know, I saw the tiered parking and you know, I've heard that said a couple of times coming to these meetings and I know how far along you guys are with that, but I can just speak from perspective of someone who's lower on the pay scale. Um, you know, I mean, I got a, a, a $3,080 a month is what I'm making. One twentieth of that is gone because I get furloughed once a month. And then I'm asked to pay for parking to come and work on campus. Um, where, I mean, to me, it lends itself to morale. You know, I'm asked to clean, clean the parking lots. I'm asked to maintain the, the grounds, and yet I have to pay. And then I can see the contractors come in, they'll fence off an area of grass, destroy it, and let them park there for how long? Um, my peers that work with the state in different agencies and different facilities pay nothing. I'm only here at UH, this is something that's restricted to UH. I, I was a county employee, I came from the county to the state, I've never had to pay for parking. We double parked at most county facilities. So I think it's like some of the lots are misused. Um, building grounds on top. You know, uh, only so many of us can get passes to park right by the shop where we can walk. Or like you said, we can park at the bottom, you know, down by athletics and then find a way up, which kills time. I don't want to spend my time walking around. You know, I also, we start work at six. Okay, so, you know, I'm supposed to bus in at what, 4.30 in the morning and spend an hour and a half both ways in the bus. I live in Waimanalo. You know, I'm not close to campus. Um, you know, I like to bring my surfboard. I can't because I park off campus. I can't even leave it there to recreate after work. And you know, all this stuff I got to pay for. When you use the term benefit, you know, it's a benefit to pay for parking. I think that's a loosely used term, to be honest with you. Um, and, and like, this is a simple solution. I'm into simple solutions. So why not up top where we have that lot? Like, and I know Enterprise gets 10 stalls up there, too. Where they're paying for stalls next to where we have to park, where we can't get stalls because there's not enough stalls for us. Why can't we just double park in there? All of our gang double car, uh, park in there. And why are we having to pay for it anyway? That's what I just don't understand. If no one else in the state has to pay for it but UH employees, you know, it cuts into our profit margin. We all have families that we have to support. And I mean, you know, we're not tenured professors. I don't make big money. I make very little money and I can barely get by. So I just don't understand it. It seems like it's just, um, like there's a lot of simpler solutions that are being applied. So that's all. You. No, that, that's the kind of feedback that we need to hear because those are the kinds of things that we need to think about. How do we want to be as a university community? So it's good. We'll, we'll, that's, um, we're taking notes on all the comments that are coming up and uh, we'll, we'll take it under consideration. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pete, and I'm from the Educational Technology Department. I'm a doctoral student, and my interest is mobile devices as educational tools. I'm also the Apple Campus Rep, and I was extremely impressed by the app that you're rolling out. The question I have, have you included other things that would benefit the campus in that app, such as the location of eating facilities, libraries, other than just the routes? Because if you have, that would be a great thing to share with incoming faculty and incoming students. We just launched, launched a new app and it's got a mobile app with it. 
um, you can go on to our website at uh, manoa.hoy.edu slash landscaping. Um, we have a map there. It has the uh, shuttle stops on it. It has um, the eateries on it. Um, we, we actually launched the program because we wanted to teach people more about um, the awesome trees we have on campus. So it also uh, provides information about our landscaping. Um, it also has construction parking and staging on it. Um, so you can tell whether or not those people belong on the grass. Uh, but um, go and check out that website. Um, there's, there's a lot of information on it that you might be able to use. Uh, we're still developing it and working on it. Um, it might be a little bit slow on the Android side, uh, but on the, the Apple platform, it works pretty well. Um, and if you're having problems with it, please send us an email and we'll try and fix it. Um, just so you understand, this is uh, a project that's being worked on with our, our department and along with a grad student and a, a bachelor's student, an undergrad. So it's kind of an exciting program and um, I hope you guys check it out. Planning department, <clears throat> and work closely with uh, the ERDL uh, lab, who's also working on creating a lot of GIS layers, have capturing a lot of the similar information, and we are sharing information um, with landscape um, and with commuter services to integrate all this on a GIS platform, which can be then exported to Google Maps, and uh, so we are working on that. Um, we're collecting all the space data on campus, but also these macro layers. So we also hope to uh, roll out a platform that uh, will be useful for campus. Hi, I, I, uh, excuse me, I've, I've got a follow-up question. In uh, one of our first meetings here, uh, w w one of the grad students up in the medical school thought of about the shuttle going from the medical school to the campus here. Has there been any, any feedback on that or anything done about that? You mean one going from Jabsum to up here? From, uh, from the other uh, medical school down, downtown. Yeah, uh, we've, we've had some discussions on that. Um, I, I think we haven't made any final decisions on that, though. Yeah, it's, we, we've discussed it, actually not in that committee, but we've discussed it at a higher level um, between, we met with some of the Jabsum people for parking because they're supposed to be building additional parking down there. So that's one of the issues that we're currently in discussions with. We haven't made any decisions on that yet, though. Well, first I want to say congratulations. What a great job you guys are doing. Thank I'm you. I'm wild, really wild. Um, I come from a very environmental family. My husband used to ride his bike to work um, three times a week from Hawaii Kai, and it's no small task to do that. Um, and I, I would ride the bike, I mean ride the bus if, I would ride the bike if I was more physically able to, but I'm not. Um, but, and I would ride the bus if it serviced Hawaii Kai better, but it doesn't. And it's not an option for me. Um, what's happened to rail? Is that dead in the water? Is there any chance we're going to get rail here? Probably not from Hawaii Kai for sure, but, you know, even from the airport or something would, would be really helpful. Yeah, I, I don't have the answer to that question. <laughs> It would be nice. It would make sense that, it, that the rail would, at some point, come to our campus. Hi, I, I also see some really wonderful things you're working on. Um, I had a question about the U-Pass for employees. How much would that cost the university? And then my second question is, how much does the U-Pass for students cost? And is that paid out of the students' fees or some other funds? The student U pass is paid out of a mandatory student fee. It's really one of the best deals around. It is $30 per semester. And it, that's the equivalent of a $60 a month benefit. You can, the cool thing with U pass is it's meant to be universal pass. You can use it, any bus line, any time, for the whole time it's valid. So kind of the discussions that we've had with the city on an employee U pass would be, um, we have been talking about fully subsidizing it, and I'll get to a reason here in a second. The, the cost would be $30 per person. Everybody would have to be covered by that. 
the kind of the concept is, you know, the bus is going to be doing the same kind of balancing act. They're going to be figuring not everybody's going to use it, but we're going to have this income come in, and they're going to do that kind of balancing act to figure out if it makes sense for them. The $30 a month rate that we would pay is half price. Um, when we looked at something that would be, you know, maybe a little different, where we would ask people to pay. We don't have a mechanism like the student fee to force everyone to pay. So at that point, it becomes just as expensive for us to try and do one where people can opt in versus having everyone um, be covered with it and, and get the lower rate from the bus. Did that make sense? It's, no, it's really not that bad. Um, I think we figured it was like 420, 450,000 a year. So, I mean, it's, an, it's certainly a substantial amount, but it's not a horrendous amount. Hi, I just wanted to encourage you to be more aggressive in expanding your electric vehicle charging stations, because each year hundreds of us make decisions on the vehicles we buy, and the availability of a charging station would make a big difference in people's um, willingness to go electric and have a zero emission vehicle. Thank you. I'd like to respond to that. So I'm from the planning office also. and. There are uh, PV, photovoltaic uh, projects and installations. We're looking at about uh, one to three megawatts on the campus over the next couple of years. And uh, the layer, of, the top layer of the parking area would have uh, PV as a canopy on it. In those areas, we can go with EV solar re uh, renewable energy charge rather than pulling electricity from the carbon-based, the fossil fuel plants, which makes no sense at all. So looking at renewable uh, charging on electric vehicles is the way to go, and that's what we're looking at with the photovoltaic installations. So I hope people get excited about that, because it's, it's going to work. I was wondering if there's, if there's been uh, any collaboration with other campuses, system campuses, for, uh, for example, a parking solution. Uh, like my friend over here, if he's uh, coming from Waimanalo, could park at Windward and, and have a direct shuttle here or on uh, Leeward campus or any other campuses that have more uh, parking, maybe cheaper or more readily available, and then run kind of specific shuttles for that. Well, we've had contact with other campuses that do not charge for parking. And they were very, how would I say, reluctant or very cautious about us extending any program that would allow our employees or students to park on their campus because then they'd be faced with a parking problem. So it's not that they say, don't come here, but they're very cautious at this point. So it's very, it's a, it's a touchy subject. Um, is, does anyone have any other questions, comments? I can speak up if you prefer. I was watching the presentation streaming and felt compelled to come down here. I heard the comment about being polite to the parking officers. I agree with that. However, I would ask that they also reciprocate that. I have been threatened by your parking officers as well as the parking control office. Okay, so I would like that to be addressed. It should only be fair that they are being civil as well as the other people. That's the first question. Thank you. Um, if I can later on after this meeting get your name and uh, contact, and I'll, I'll be discussing that with you. Because yes, we do expect our officers to be just as courteous as. Uh, we want you to be to them. There's no reason for them to be rude or obnoxious when they're issuing a citation. And actually, you know, we're all working together. 
they have a job to do, but also uh, we have an expectation of them on the type of conduct that they, and the way they conduct themselves and do business for us because we do hire them. They're a contracted service and also, you know, um, it goes, it's a two-way street. So, thank you. But I will speak to you later. Second part. There also seems to be a preferential treatment which is given to athletic events in the parking structure. And I'm sorry if you covered this before I got here. There have been many times where people come in to park and facilities are not open as advertised. The guards, which I heard you say a moment ago, that are being paid to do a job are not doing their job. They are telling people to go up, they're telling people to go down, they're telling people to go sideways. You're running all over the creation in the parking structure and it's not a way to do this. It's not a way to operate. If we are paying them good money, they should be working. I see them standing around doing nothing. And why are our funds being misused in that respect? In that same venue, I have heard that people say, well, we're paying this service, but some people don't read or speak English. Seems like we should be getting more for our money. Okay, on that last issue, um, I know the legislature has passed a law that will go into effect this summer that all of the security officers employed throughout the state, even the one gentleman at the condominium you may live in, they all have to be certified. And that would include a, uh, a certain level of proficiency in communication and, and, and a test being passed. So um, we're hoping that you know, we screen our, we have our contractors screen our offices. So we're trying to improve the quality of employees that we have hired for our contracted service. But in, quest in your question regarding the special events, we do have a special events traffic plan. So there is a, or I say, an order to the madness. And they're not necessarily always following our plan. And that's, that's our fault. That's a, as managers, we need to go out there, watch what they're doing. And every once in a while, they tend to go off on a tangent and they may not be following our plan. This was brought to our attention and we were made aware of this through some surveys put out by the athletic department. Uh, they asked their, their patrons how they liked uh, attending the games and some of the pluses and minuses they felt were going on. And some of the feedback we're getting is very similar to what you were expressing. So we've already made some changes and we are doing more changes and evaluating on what's going on and, uh, during these events so that it's not just um, for the, the sports fans, but it's for you know, half of the structure when the athletic event starts are our employees and students. So we have to make sure that we can take care of them also. Okay, well thank you all for coming and spending your valuable time with us today. There is the email address up there. We continue to solicit uh, input from you and we will constantly be going back out to you with things as we roll out. I think part of what we don't do well as administration is communicate and market back to you what we actually have and we're making a greater effort to try and do that. So thank you all.